Hey, it's Nancy. Before we begin today, I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Crime Beat early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. A listener's note. The following episode contains coarse language, adult themes, and content of a violent and disturbing nature, and may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. On April 14th, 2022, two senior police officers, Sergeant Brian Topham and Corporal Brandon Tobin, received the highest honor that's bestowed by the RCMP. The Commissioner's Commendation for Bravery recognizes outstanding courage in the face of dangerous circumstances, but the award came at a cost. The details of that day never go away. Never. Never. He turned and started shooting at us like right away. There was no, there was no pause, no delay. Like he started shooting at us like right away. We got shots fired, shots fired. All I saw was his body hanging out of the driver's door and his left arm was swinging. I'm Nancy Hickst, a senior crime reporter for Global News. Today on Crime Beat, I want to share how two officers, both diagnosed with PTSD, are working to move forward and raise awareness about the trauma they're living with. This is The Scars That Don't Heal. This story began in the spring of 2018. The body of a young woman was found in the backyard of a home in the Northeast Calgary community of Marlborough Park. Nadia L. Dibb was found stabbed and shot to death. Evidence pointed to the killer being Adam Betahar, a man Nadia had once dated but spurned his advances for a relationship. Betahar decided if he couldn't have her, no one would. After he killed Nadia, he went on the run. For days, he eluded investigators, but bank and phone activity placed him in and around Edmonton, the provincial capital three hours north of Calgary. RCMP officers in the area were told to be on the lookout for Betahar. I had been aware of what had happened in Calgary because I got um, an email from my old detachment with regards to a bolo, and what that's, what that's called is a be on the lookout. So it was sent out Canada-wide, I believe, because a Canada-wide warrant had been issued, basically advising members and other police to keep an eye out for a blue Ford Explorer, as well as the suspect. That's Corporal Brandon Tobin from the Evansburg RCMP detachment, about an hour's drive west of Edmonton. On the morning of the 29th, I walked into the office just before 7 a.m. and my phone was already ringing at my desk. So I answered it and it was the detective from Calgary. Calgary police asked Corporal Tobin to track down CCTV from a gas station near Evansburg, where Bedahar made a phone call earlier that morning. Basically, uh, he pulled up to the gas pumps, he purchased some gas, he made some purchases inside the gas station and made a phone call using the gas station's landline. I sent it, the video to them for their investigation and then sent out a bulletin to the surrounding detachments to notify them that he had been seen in our area. And he was in our area, I believe, at around 5 a.m. We did keep an eye out for this guy throughout the day. We talked to Fish and Wildlife and, and, and advised him, like, if you see this vehicle in the area, let us know. Hours later, Corporal Tobin headed home after his shift. I was on call, so I was in a police car. Um, but I'm just, you know, listening to music and driving home. And all of a sudden, this I see this blue Ford Explorer coming towards me. And I was like, oh, is that? I wonder if that's the one. So I turned around and attempted to catch up. And then I, that's when I knew something was going on because it took me a long time to catch up to that Explorer because he had seen me and, you know, sped, tried to speed away. From what I can recall, he was at least doing 150 because I was doing two, over 200 and it took me some time to catch up to him. 
I had readied my patrol carbine at that point because something was telling me that this isn't right and this is probably the vehicle. Um, there's not that many blue Ford Explorers that I come across in the run of a day, so it just happens to be one driving through our area when we knew to be on the lookout for one. The officer finally caught up to the vehicle about 20 kilometers south of Evansburg. He was able to confirm it was the suspect. Adam Bedahar refused to pull over, and that's when Corporal Tobin engaged in a pursuit. You have to get guys called out, you have to get roadblocks set up. Detachment Commander, veteran RCMP Sergeant Brian Topham was immediately notified. Because the, the vehicle was confirmed through, by Brandon as being the one we were looking for, then other detachments were contacted, neighboring detachments were con contacted, and they kind of converged on Highway 16. I got there just as they were coming back west at one of the range roads that were west of Evansburg. And so I was able to get, get a, find a crossover, and then I was in amongst the first batch of vehicles that were directly behind our suspect. I just saw a sea of red and blue lights behind me. There must have been, I'd say, like 15 police cars behind me. Corporal Tobin can be heard calling out what was unfolding over his radio. Straight through 95, he's straight through 95, still eastbound on 16. We were basically going down the highway in a, like a staggered box formation, and we would call in updates as uh, Betahar's driving pattern changed, the vehicle condition changed, the location where we were. That was my job, and that's why you hear me on the radio saying we're at this crossroad, we're here, we're here, and it's just a way of having members, you know, staggered and set up all the way up the highway in order to prevent traffic from flowing down. Betahar drove at incredibly high speeds up and down the highway and dodged four spike belts before finally... But that still didn't stop him. I'll let Sergeant Topham and Corporal Tobin take you through the details as they unfold it, and a warning, some of these details are graphic. He's bound determined to get away, or he wanted to. He, he drove that vehicle until it mechanically could not go any further. Just under 70 kilometers an hour. I don't know how much more of that vehicle is going to stay on the road. It's shaking pretty bad. He's still losing lots of parts, so it, it can't be much longer. He's got sparks and metal chunks going everywhere here now. It is down to 40 kilometers an hour, 20, 30, 30 kilometers an hour, 20 kilometers an hour. He is stopped. He is stopped. We're approaching. I did a countdown on his speed. You'll hear me go 30 kilometers an hour, 20 kilometers an hour, 10. He stopped. We're approaching. So my goal at that time was to attempt to make contact with Bedahar, but I didn't have a chance. Because as I was putting my vehicle in park was when the first shot rang through Sergeant Topham's police car. And in the time it took for me to get to Sergeant Topham's police car, Bedahar had already put three rounds through that car. I was not very far behind Sergeant Topham, so that tells you how fast it was. So I'm still putting on the brakes, putting it in park, bang. As I'm getting out, there's another one, and as I get to the back of his police vehicle, he was only a short, not even a vehicle length away from, from me, and another round had went through the vehicle. And I remember, like, feeling the concussions from his barrel, because it was sticking around the rear of the Explorer. I can remember feeling that, like, pressure, the concussions of, like, pow, and you, you feel it. And I remember seeing Sergeant Topham's vehicle kind of shake a little bit. And I was wondering what was taking him so long to get out of the car. So I had peeked around to the driver's side of his Tahoe because I was at the rear passenger side of his, of his patrol car. And I could see Brian hiding behind the dash. And then I was like, okay. And I went back to the 
there's no polite way of saying it. I went back to exchanging gunfire with Bedahar, and something told me to check on Sergeant Topham again. And that's when I saw him get hit. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that that was happening. All I saw was his body hanging out of the driver's door and his left arm was swinging. And it wasn't swinging like there was life to it. It was just dangling. And I could see the hole in the back of his head and just blood going all over the side of his patrol car door. I thought he was dead. I saw him die, in my opinion. I can't even explain it. Like he had to be there. I don't know how to explain it. So just the overwhelming, the overwhelming shutdown of what you just saw and being like, that person's dead. Someone I know, I just watched it. Sergeant Brian Topham was hit. I remember laying across the seat with my head towards the, pass the driver's door, and I swung the door open and looked down towards the back of the vehicle where Brandon was, that's where I knew I had to go. And I put my head out the door, and then um, a round came through the door at the driver's mirror and got me in the back left of my head. Um, I remember um, losing consciousness for a second, and, and a strange thought entered my mind right away as soon as I was hit, because I felt the bullet hit my head, but it didn't hurt. And so I remember asking myself, I said, I wonder if dead people know they're dead because it didn't hurt. And then it started to hurt right away. And it's okay, you're not dead, but you got to get out of the vehicle. But I could still hear the rounds uh, that the, he was shooting and hitting the truck. And so eventually I couldn't see out of my left eye and the amount of blood that was coming off from the bullet wound was partially blinding me in my right eye. And so I couldn't see, but I could hear the brass from Brandon's carbine hitting the pavement. And so then I dropped down onto the ground outside of the driver's door and I crawled back to where he was. And I remember um, getting to him because I recognized his boot. I remember looking at my right eye and I said, okay, I made it because there's his boots. And um, then I passed out. The next thing I remember was um, Brandon reached down, he touched my head. And then a big guy, one of our guys, and I didn't know until afterwards who it was, ran over and grabbed me while the bullets were still flying and picked me up and dragged me behind another vehicle that was there and put me down on the ground. So we're still getting shot at, and uh, bullets are still flying through. Uh, metal's flying everywhere from the vehicles getting hit. I remember getting sprayed in the side of the face with something stung, probably metal. There was a lot of stuff flying around that day. But um, it's the two strangest feelings I've ever had in my life where I just watched my commander get shot in the head, and I think he's dead, and he looks dead to me. And then all of a sudden he's not, because I couldn't believe what I saw. So when I went back to look at him again, he was crawling on the ground towards me and he was still gushing blood and stuff. And when he got to the back, the whole idea of what I was doing is I was trying to see what kind of cut was on his head. So I was trying to feel it. And I can still remember like his feeling his buzz cut hair and trying and like all the blood squirting over my hand and I'm trying to see if it's like what kind of injury it is. And that's when I yelled, like, get up here, get up here. And that's when um, the member from Stony Plain, Jeff, ran up under fire, grabbed Brian, and then dragged Brian back to my patrol car where they did first aid on him behind my patrol car while the shooting is still going on. And I was there for a bit while they were working on uh, the bullet wound to my head. And then I remember saying I was getting cold and they carried me to another police vehicle further away from where the shooting was. And I remember laying on another member's lap for a while. 
And then a ground ambulance came and I was carried over to the ground ambulance. And then um, stars came and I was loaded into the helicopter and then I flew to the U of A. In less than 75 seconds, Bedahar fired 10 rounds from his semi-automatic rifle. 11 officers returned fire, shooting a total of 202 rounds. Then finally, it stopped. With the firefight over, police surveyed the scene and found Bedahar dead from multiple gunshot wounds. When you make that decision to discharge your firearm at somebody, like, that's some pretty heavy stuff. And that stays with you forever. In a previous Crime Beat update, I explained details of an independent investigation by the Alberta Serious Incident Response Team. ACERT found Bedahar presented a lethal risk and was shooting to kill, not just to provoke a police response. Both Sergeant Brian Topham and Corporal Brandon Tobin were hit in the shootout. It's pretty hard to believe that I never met him before, I never said a word to him, and neither did Brian, and he tried to kill us. I felt something on my left shoulder back here. Um, I remember it was hot and it was sharp and it was just like, Whoa, and it made me straighten up a little bit. Yeah, I went to the just the local hospital um, and got some x-rays and turns out I had some bullet fragments in my right arm that are still there. They left them there just because they're too spread out and it would cause too much damage to remove them all. It's any cop's wife's worst fear is that they come and tell you that your husband or your wife or whatever has been hurt. And, um, you know, saying like he's been shot. The doctor said if your head had been up another millimeter or two, the round would have probably come out of your left eye. And so he said, <laughs> he remember saying you're, you're lucky because it didn't, there wasn't much space for um, anything else other than exactly what happened. Because like I said, the bullet hit the back of my head on the left side and I must have got my head down just low enough that it went across my scalp to my skull for about three inches back to front. Police always believe that they have all the right stuff. So when something bad happens, you will run forward and you won't hesitate and you will risk your life for Albertans and Canadians. That's what you just, we believe that's what we'll do. But you really don't, you really can't say that's what you'll do until an opportunity presents itself where you have to make that decision. And on that day, there were at least um, a dozen more uh, policemen, men and women, who, um, who ran forward to get me when the bullets were still flying and they never hesitated. They didn't wait to, um, you know, to not jeopardize their lives. Like they ran towards me when the bullets were still flying. And the guy that came and picked me up, he exposed himself to gunfire to get me. And none of them thought twice about it. They just did it. Just weeks after Nadia was killed, her family requested to meet with the RCMP officers who put their lives on the line to catch her killer. Here's Nadia's father, Sammy L. Dibb. This is the first time he's talked to a journalist. He did an interview with me for Global TV's original true crime documentary series based on this podcast. Thanked them for risking their life just to make it to have the justice and stop that guy for uh, hurting somebody else. The L. Dibb family's care and concern was unexpected by the officers. It's unheard of, like we don't, like in my 40 years, no one, like you'll get a phone call sometimes or you get a card in the mail saying, okay, thank you very much. We appreciate what you did and stuff like that. But they actually were concerned about us. Like genuinely concerned that we were okay. I'll never forget the look in her dad's eyes. Nadia's family, Sergeant Topham and Corporal Tobin still stay in touch. They share scars that will never heal. 
I still can't believe that day happened and it's four years later. And I think about it all the time. I don't take that highway to work anymore. Um, and I, <clears throat> I even, the detachment chipped in on Nadia's anniversary of her death and sent flowers, right? So, never did that too for any other victim, but I can't stop thinking about it. It is as clear now as it was that day. I can still taste the blood in my mouth. And um, I can still remember how, how scared I was that I was gonna die that day on the side of the road. And I can still see um, Brandon's boot as clear as, a, I could draw a picture of it that I knew I'd gotten to where he was and that because I'd gotten to where he was, that um, I was gonna be okay. Once I got to where Brandon was, I knew I'd made it as far as I could go, but I also knew that because Brandon was there, that I was gonna be all right. And so um, it, it, um, the details of that day never go away, never, never. This wasn't Sergeant Topham's first experience with post-traumatic stress. He had a previous episode following a traumatic event, and the shooting precipitated a resurgence of PTSD. Um, I remember when I got home, um, I went upstairs and I went into the bedroom and I sat down on the end of the bed and... Um, I started to cry and it was the only time, it's been the only time during this whole event where I wished I was dead because I knew um, how hard the struggle was going to be to get to where I was before I had been shot. Like it had taken years from previous events to get to a point in your life where you can deal with the trauma and those kinds of things and you start to feel like, okay, I'm okay. There's a new normal and I'm gonna be okay. And so then your life goes on. And then when this event happened, you start over from scratch. On that day, my wife came upstairs to the bedroom and you know, she saw me sitting there crying and she asked why and I told her and she said, you know, don't be silly. You have to, you know, you, you have to fight again. And because um, I need you and your daughters need you and your sons need you and friends. And so you have to fight. Both Corporal Tobin and Sergeant Topham talk to a psychologist regularly as they learn to heal and manage their PTSD. I was diagnosed with PTSD a while after this because I was under the impression that I was okay. And Brian and I talked about it a lot. He's like, you really should go see someone. So now I go to the same psychologist that Sergeant Topham does. Um, and I've been going there for years now and I go once every three weeks. And it, it comes up. It, it constantly comes up. Um, and in the run of a day, I'd say it pops into my head at least seven or eight times. Just whether it's driving by the, Brian and I were going to a call one time and we were sitting across from the intersection of that highway and I pointed it out to him. I'm like, that's the highway that I was on when I found Better Her. Like that's, it's just something that never really goes away and I don't think it actually will. Like I'll be, I'm only 34, just about 35, and be retired when I'm 55, but I'll still remember every detail about uh, what happened. It's a struggle every day. You have to learn to live with, because it's not gonna go away, and it's gonna be a part of my life and my family's life forever. And so then um, you have to learn to live with it as part of, of um, moving on because if you don't then you'll 
it's been my experience, like you'll start to spiral out of control. You'll start to do things that you wouldn't normally do. And, and that's not what you want. Um, enough policemen harm themselves or commit suicide and emergency services providers because of PTSD. So PTSD can never win. So that has to be the focus on the fight is PTSD can't win. I have to win this fight. And so I fought that day on the 29th of March and won. And I will fight this fight now and I'll win, I'll win. You end up having, or at least for me anyways, um, emotional episodes where for no reason, you just start to cry. No reason at all. You could be watching a hockey game or listening to the weather on TV, and then suddenly you just start to cry. And so um, my wife has got really good at seeing the signs that that's going to happen. And so when that happens, and it happens fairly regular still, is she just walks over and we hold on to one another. And sometimes it lasts a couple of seconds, sometimes several minutes. And then when it's over, it's kind of like, we just pick up and go on. How about the moilers? Like, it's just, it's just, it has become part of what, who I am now. They've learned there will be good days and bad days, but both are thankful they're alive to share their stories and spread awareness about living with PTSD. When it's that close, it really makes you appreciate what you have a little bit more when you go home and you're like, you know, I have a, you know, I'm married, I have a dog and a cat and uh, I have a good home life. And it just makes me appreciate that a little bit more as time goes on. I enjoy my life now. Um, I have uh, a brand new granddaughter. I have another granddaughter on the way and um, retirement is in the future. And so um, I'm more than happy that I'm still here and still alive and still, you know, able to do my job. I came back and I was able to go back to work and do my job, the job that I love doing. I want to thank Corporal Tobin and Sergeant Topham for their willingness to talk about what happened and share their experiences with PTSD. According to statistics released by the Canadian government in 2019, an estimated 23% of participating public safety personnel showed symptoms of PTSD. Later this week, I'll be re-releasing a remastered episode where I share Nadia Eldib's story from season one. I hope you'll take the time to listen to this important case. I also want to let you know Nadia's family continues to keep her memory alive as they raise awareness about domestic violence. I will share a link to Nadia's Hope Foundation in the show notes. Crime Beat is written and produced by me, Nancy Hickst, with producer Dila Velasquez. Audio editing and sound design is by Rob Johnston. Special thanks to photographer-editor Danny Lantella for his work on this episode. And thanks to Chris Bassett, the VP of Content and Distribution and Editorial Standards for Global News. I would love to have you tell a friend about this podcast, and you can help me share these important stories by rating and reviewing Crime Beat on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can find me on Twitter at Nancy Hickst, on Facebook at Nancy Hickst Crime Beat, or on Instagram at Nancy.Hickst. Thanks again for listening. Please join me next time. <laughs>